Welcome to Gentlemen's History Hour. I'm Equality. I'm Rob J10X. And today we have a distinguished guest. We have Miss India Lovejoy. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Hey, this, it's Gentlemen's History Hour, but we have a lady, so it's two gentlemen and a lady on the podcast today so yeah. um, absolutely it's women's history month like okay. in just a couple of days so oh, oh so we right it's, on time it's fitting yeah yeah it's, 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 it's good timing we are still on location at collective for the culture part three and continuing in that in that tradition of collective for the culture part three we have the second half of the people that brought you collective for the culture one two and three she's uh cultural producer i like yes. that title can you give us some history on what a cultural producer is um a cultural producer at least in my mind are people mm -hmm. that are producing events functions projects that are pushing the culture forward mm -hmm. it's a little bit deeper than curatorial work because you're actually fueling the project it's not the same so what robert does he selects the artist the mm -hmm. art he places the art and kind of gives it all its creative direction which is a huge job mm -hmm. what i do is actually make it work and you know work with all the artists individually we have almost 40 artists in this show mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is a lot to deal with yeah. <laughs> i can tell you now but um and then also the events and the management just the overall like the de the details right and so I produce it by making it all work together, and that's what yeah. I do. I mean, I, basically what I call myself is like a Swiss army knife for artists, mm. you know? So okay. it's really the capability to do a lot of different things to push these, like, ideas that are part of the culture forward. Okay. Before we get into the, the history of your involvement in Collective for the Culture, let's just get into your personal history, if you don't mind. Is that, is that okay. fine? If we I'm get ready. too evasive, okay. let us let us know. This is a history show, so we you know we talk about historical events, but we want to talk about historical people. In the beginning, there was moves. the word, and the word was with India. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so from what I understand, you're not originally from Houston, historically, right? Yeah. So you want to get into that? Your how you ended up here in Houston? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've told this story a bunch of times, but I've never been like recorded telling the story. But Houston is home. You know, so uh, I originally came to Houston in 2011. I was 18. I uh, came on a Greyhound bus. I had just graduated high school and I just like got out of Dodge. I'm originally from Colorado, but when I came to Texas, I was going to school in Iowa, which I never t just cut that from the record. <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't want to rep that? Uh, <laughs> uh, but I did go to school there, um, high school and college. And, you know, I came to Houston right after I finished high school. And it's like at the end of the summer, I called my mom and I was like, I'm not going to college. I'm never mm. coming back. Mm. She's like crying and like, and you please just go. Mm. <laughs> I went to college. And, um, and then, you know, when I finished, I came and stayed in, in Houston forever. Like, Houston is definitely home for me. Yeah, I lived yeah. a bunch of places. Uh, and when I got here, it's just like something really magical happened. So I did, feel like when you got here, did the art world find you or did you find the creative world? I how guess did, in a way, like, happen? both. Uh, so when I came in 2011, I mean, I got like a job off Craigslist, like at a pizza shop in Cyprus, you know, that was a whole like my starting phase of just building like a network and, you know, being 18. Once I graduated college, that's when I got into the actual arts and like event management. That's when I was like, OK, I want to start Black Buddha, but, you know, I don't know what okay, I'm doing. So you came, you came because in my mind, I was thinking what's, what summer would it have had to have been for you to call your mom and, uh, and tell her that. <laughs> and I was uh, I was off but so that was the drake summer that, and that's that's 2011 you can't yeah. that was oh, a, right off I'm so so funny you say it, i'm coming now <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, you was probably yeah. here this was back with downtown was like, was that was Yolo downtown. Came out my first yeah. year yeah all of that yeah. all of that so um, a... but no uh i just loved houston i love the people and that was where it started right so i kept coming back I, I went to college like i said but then i came back every summer that's you know i started doing internships here i started working events and I got into just like promotions all these different I started I mean I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes to have multiple jobs and do a lot of different stuff so I, I dabbled in a lot of stuff when I first got to Houston but when I came here as a resident after I had graduated from from college uh, 
I got a job at Project Row Houses, mm. and that was my first kind of touch point to fine arts and the artists of Houston. And I just got a really intimate understanding of what was happening in the arts industry in this city specifically. So that that was like the roots. And you know, I always find it's, it seems like Houston is best appreciated sometimes by people not not uh, from here. I think in a lot of ways we've been spoiled with the city, but like what. What was it about Houston, maybe in comparison? I don't know a lot of people usually mention Atlanta, New York. Mm-hmm. But what, what, what was it that made Houston, you know, unique or connect with you? I love the diversity. You know, um, like I said, you know, I was living in Iowa at the time. There's no diversity. I mean, that's I was saying this before we started. You know, mm-hmm. I got a scholarship because. They just need people like me to be yeah. attending that school. And, you know, I love my alma mater or whatever, but... You just don't want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with it, you. It's not important, yeah. you know. Um, but the point is, is that Houston just had so many different people that were, were my people. And I love that. I feel like, you know, anyone that comes to this city can find their people. And that's something really special. But beyond that, there's just all these all these spaces, like all these people, people are really open. Like Houston is a hustle city. I'm a hustler. Like in my heart of hearts, mm-hmm. you know, I love the grind and the city yeah. is built for that. And people really respect that. And, and you know, there's just a lot of opportunity here. So me, and it's like a blank canvas sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. it. It is a blank canvas, especially for people that's coming from out of state. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you guys just started at Project Row House. Did you know any of the history of the Project Row House Um, before you started working there or did you learn it as you started working at Project Row House with how they curate the different what we call shotgun houses Mm -hmm. um, different artists no uh yeah I definitely learned so much during my time there and that was just such like a beneficial experience for me just like as an individual but also you know as a arts administrator someone who was there I I was I was really lucky so Rick Lowe you know is the one that brought me onto the team but he had this like vision for the collectors club and it was a way for like artists to you know kind of retouch with PRH because they had done like I think at least 40 40 some odd rounds before I even got there so there was just this massive list of like um, over 400 artists They wanted to give them a touch point so you know we were selling art to fundraise for the organization Hmm. but the point is is before i got there the program didn't exist and so you know rick gave me just like a one sheet paper the the collector's club oh okay Okay. and so i was organizing events to Hmm. teach people how to buy art like the Hmm. whole like motto was the democratization of art collecting and you were i know y'all were talking about the uh, the row houses you worked there Mm -hmm. i know uh we got a brother who was accepted to, you know, HSPVA and all that. And, you know, I'm just a gangster, I suppose. Could y'all just like, <laughs> could y'all just break down what, what exactly Project Row Houses is, and uh, for people who may not be familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's actually really informative to even what's happening here. But mm-hmm. Project Row Houses is a series of shotgun houses, but it's grown way beyond that. But you know, it was founded in I think 1993 or 92. It's 93. It's definitely 93 um, by seven artists, um, which a majority of which have actually been featured in Collective for the Culture. So it's Rick Lowe, Jesse Lott, James Bettison, um, Bert Long, Bert Samples, George Smith, um, and Floyd Newsom. And so that's like kind of the founding seven of Project Row Houses. And so those are kind of like the OGs in the mm. city. Mm. They found these houses. It was identified as like one of the most dangerous blocks in Houston. They did a whole news segment on it. So it's all these abandoned shotgun houses. They feature it like this is the most dangerous place in Houston. Well, these seven artists get together they kind of take control of the block. They have art take control of the block. Um, wow. And I still have like the whole tour memorized. I'm not gonna give you the 45 wow. minute tour. But the point is, is you know, they took over the block with art. The city eventually granted them ownership of all the houses mm-hmm. because they really honored what they did. That was 25 plus years ago, you wow. know? And so since then, like I said, they work with 400 artists. It's internationally renowned. The Smithsonian in Washington features them. Wow. Um, you know, the primary founder, Rick Lowe, has gone on to receive like the MacArthur Genius yeah. Award for his work, along wow. with several other awards. You know, so it's influenced a lot of people, but it's really about using alternative space making, social sculpture, and using art to like change the community. So that being like my yeah. roots, it informed a lot of my practice. That was your first, yeah. that was your first, right out of college, that was your first job? 
Mm-hmm. What, what do you think it is about like art that like can take, you know, basically like what you say, like a shotgun? Because I've been there and it reminds me of like, basically it reminds me of my grandma's neighborhood, my grandma in Gertown, New Orleans, when I used to go there. But what is it about like art that like changes the whole, is it the fact that you, now like, you know, someone cares or like, it's something, because I've seen that happen before in just in, in, in impoverished areas where if somebody puts a, uh, makes it something, all of a sudden everyone feels different about it. Is it mm-hmm. What do you think, like, is it a, an emotional thing or how does that psychologically change? Like, because why, why are they still not just four row houses? We just gonna come, hey, we've been most dangerous block. We don't mind being dangerous in front of these art houses too. Like, why does art do that to to us? Well, it does this to most people, but I can tell you, you know, the, there was a lot of stuff that happened in those houses before they, it became okay. what it was, you know. But anyways, no, uh, the row houses, it's always like everyone has a crazy row house story. But anyways, I, the way I can answer that question is even the same with this space. You know, if you look at the before and after pictures of what yeah. we did, it looks so cold, so dry, mm-hmm. so just kind of like empty inside. And now when you're here, they're just like, it's so regal, you know? And it's like each piece is just like projecting this energy out of it. And it's it's almost unavoidable. And I remember when even Robert first, like, you know, brought me to the space and was like, I think we can do our show here, you know? And I was like, mm. yeah, I mean, it's tight, but I don't know. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. like, it didn't yeah. even really capture me like that. But then, you know, obviously we did the project. Um, but then when we started hanging the first pieces, at, we were here, it was like maybe like two in the morning, you know, and I just like got kind of hypnotized looking at this one work and it was just crazy because it was like in that moment, I was like, whoa, this is going to be epic in the art. It just, it puts some soul in it and it's just kind of the difference between a mannequin and a human, mm. right? It's like, yeah. it's the object huh. and then all yes. of a sudden it has this like spirit yeah. to it that really you can connect with and, and it's just undeniable. Yeah, I want to wow. give a shout out to... Um, DJ Flash Gordon Parks, because we actually had yeah. one of the rounds at Project Row House. Oh. We actually had a house that oh, we did. Yeah. Oh, we had, really? hey. yeah, we had a book called The Beautiful Side of Ugly. It was poetry and photography. Flash is also a photographer, uh, aside from being a DJ. And then I do poetry. I actually didn't know that. And I do poetry. And so based on the book, we came in there and painted, got stuff from the street, put it in there. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a really good experience to have. What round was being that? A part. Oh, man, I, I forgot. I have the newspaper clippings and some of the stuff, but I yeah. just, I forgot. And that was my first time actually being embedded in like the art, art scene, coming as an outsider. Mm-hmm. But that's just a little side note, just having that experience. But to answer that question, um, it does, you, you take something, it does lend an energy to it. It's like painting your house. If your, mm-hmm. your walls are white and you add color, people come in and it just, it, it adds an energy to mm-hmm. it. It could mm-hmm. be happy, sad, you know, but it adds something uh, uh, away from just a plain white exterior or something. Most so up. if you, mm-hmm. you take that mm-hmm. and then with Project Road, they developed into, I think, having houses for single mothers um, mm-hmm. outside of just art programs. Affordable you know. housing, yeah. they're doing, they've been in the midst, I think it's been going on for about three, four years now, actually about five years technically, the EEDC. Yeah which is all about combating gentrification in Third Ward, which yeah. is a great initiative and providing more affordable housing, protecting people. They do all kinds of stuff. You know, it really is a great organization. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like transformed a mm-hmm. lot in the last few years, but overall, you know, the, the heart of what it is still inspires so many people all around the world. So you cut your teeth at Project Row House. Mm-hmm. So- That's a good way to put it, because it wasn't easy, okay? So. <laughs> So when did this this Black Buddha, when did Black Buddha come into uh, into play? Was that along the trajectory of leaving Project yes. Row? Yes, absolutely. And I think I said this, but when I came in 2015, mm-hmm. I came with the intention to start my own business, to start Black Buddha. But the thing is, is I didn't really know what it was or really what I was doing. But um, one of the last courses I took in college was like entrepreneurship and hospitality because well whatever the point is is that um I did this project and it was like come up with a business plan la da da I came up with this like concept called 
T and it was like the eating artist and it was mm. like my whole idea like artists that don't starve so it was like the eating oh. artist was yeah we like that <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, come on yeah I yeah, 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 yeah. scratch that from the record yeah. too Marco oh scratch that from the record no, 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 we no, got I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Hey, I had to yeah. think of that yeah, yeah but, but that, that was Marga. that was my first concept so I built out yeah. this whole business plan and it was really crazy because I was like revealing it maybe a couple of years back and I was like damn like I did all of that like mm -hmm. and you know it just was something that happened when I was like 21 I think when I made it and then you know I was starting Black Buddha around like 25 but Black Buddha was like the subset of conceptualizing tea and then going into the Shabbat Project Row Houses it really informed a lot of my practice but a, a critical thing that I needed to do was like understand the art industry and just after getting that job I was immediately aware of how much I didn't know because mm -hmm. when you first come into the industry it's like okay everything looks great but all these prices are different all these artists yeah. are different these CV like everything is different so it's hard to like center yourself and so what I did was I just like interviewed a bunch of artists and that really informed my practice a lot so those interviews were you know long interviews that happened over the course of several months towards the end of like my tenure at, at Project Row Houses, um, I wasn't really working with artists as much. And that was where I found like my heart, my passion really was centered at, you know? And so um, I left to start Black Buddha. And it took about like three months before I really understood what it is that I wanted to do. Hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, took, I took my time, I conceptualized it, and I started doing alternative space events. And you so my- you said, but at 25, one thing I, I just wanted to ask you, how did you, I think a lot of young artists make the make this uh, false connection between passion, caring, and being broke, um, you know, or, or as, it's, as it's some type of like badge of honor. How could, at that age, what, what had you thinking where it's like, hey, I'm gonna be a dope artist and, we're, and I'm gonna make money too, you know, what inspired that you know, uh, belief system. So. Well, I already said I'm a hustler. I like I work hard, and um, you know, I uh, I mean, but that was also one of the reasons why I couldn't do what I wanted to do at Project Row House is being a nonprofit, like operating from the point of like mm -hmm. the only reason why I do this is a position of service. Like you a know. passion. It was more of a passion. But it's a, like I have a passion for being like paid for my practice. Yeah, right? you still want to get know? paid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I so passion, but, passion don't pay the light bill, man. Hey, I like I like that. I have a passion for being paid for my <laughs> yeah. Hey, I like that. Hey, yeah. hey, 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 bars. That's yeah. one of the arts. The <laughs> art of, the art of getting paid. Yeah. You got some way. It, that was the thing. You know, and Robert's always talking about this, like about this like stigma of the starving artist. But yeah, I mean y'all can already that. see like yeah. T, the eating artist. Mm -hmm. I would have been thinking about that. Yeah. Like just breaking that down and, and cutting that part of taking of away that stigma out. of yeah. just having to be the the starving Absolutely. artist. And and really, you know, when it came to Black Buddha I think I just, I, I love being in that position where I could support artists in, in their practice, whether it's by selling their works or, or just being like administrative support or whatever. And so I was really open. Like I did a lot of stuff in the beginning. That was 2017. Mm -hmm. I think actually one of the first like things I did coordinating artists, even before I did my first actual event was this like independent contract to do an art show at a fried chicken event. So I like, Hold on, what? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but, art show at a fried chicken event? But it wasn't really an art show. Like basically they hired me to book artists to have artist booths. So it was like an art market, but it was a fried chicken festival. And so I didn't know like, they had it. I hope it was. Oh, I thought like, it was. I, wait, was I? Who there? put that on? I was, I, 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 I <laughs> it was, was at there. like Levy Park. Yeah, I was yeah. at there. Yeah. Man, they had a red shirt they gave you. Like, uh, they had a. It was. I like had, Frenchy sponsored yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I went to that event. Yeah. It was Fried chicken event. I didn't. I didn't. That's yeah. so yeah. funny. Did they have a chicken eating contest on the stage? Like, oh, man. Oh, they did. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was in that contest. Like, yeah. Whoa, oh, man. Yeah. Not the chicken eating contest. Oh, man. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Nobody knows about this. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I was just really open. But let me, let me ask you this: How would you define? Because we're we're casually having this conversation and we're saying uh, Black Buddha, but how would you define the Black Buddha agency? 
Black Buddha, I mean, I wish I had the mission statement me- me- memorized. But just if like someone wanted one. to know, okay, but what, look, you know. we're a fine arts agency mm-hmm. as well as an event producing agency. So okay. when it comes down to the things that you can hire me to do, it's absolutely always going to be art centric. But, you know, I've been hired to provide like professional services to artists mm-hmm. to even just be there. Like if an artist is like, hey, I want to do a pop up event, like, mm. but I want you to like be representing me for that night. So I do okay. like kind of experiential things even this this whole thing is an experiment like we had no idea people were gonna love us so much um but we also you know just wanted to try and see and it's like total like hit the nail on the head um but i I work with artists and i said swiss army knife so you know how many things can you do with a swiss army knife a lot so but i i really am right now shifting all of my attention to how can i support more artists doing what they do i do work with collectors to identify works um but you know there's a lot of great dealers and galleries in this city that can help you much more extensively like I really see the future of the entire agency being a lot more centric to uplifting artists and producing more shows and alternative space events to connect people how to support those artists so that's not very succinct at all I'll work on it no but, <laughs> but, it's, no, it's, but it's a lot it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot but one thing though, I, I want to go back to what you the now what you're saying now seems to be a, a reflection of what you said earlier which is when you didn't when you came in to the space and you didn't know things, you sat down with people for hours and hours and mm-hmm. did month long interviews and um, and you really studied and learned. And it's very really rare, to, one of the things I'm just listening to, I'm in admiration about is that you have a space and you want to serve the space, but you knew that you didn't know certain things in the beginning and you went and you got that information. And you think it's like, it's um, to me I feel like you're like a hybrid, a person who has like the, the education and has some, and has the ability to research, but has the passion and has the hands-on understanding of like uh, mm-hmm. the artist on that level. Like, wh- what made you want to serve in that way instead of you you being the, the star and you just being all about you? Like, um, that's a that's a really good question. And you know, when I first started Black Buddha, everyone was just like why isn't it the India Lovejoy Gallery? Because people didn't really start paying attention because my first two events were really like small. Although like they were very well received, Mm -hmm. they were small. I mean, I think my whole audience was maybe, you know, 250 people at most like and that was my first two events and they did small? great yeah, I, well that's two I events I mean for an underground for, yeah. for an underground rapper or somebody that's, right. that's a big gig <laughs> yeah. well, and, yeah. and, and I was making money you know so yeah. I realized I was like people love this they're paying me this is great so I kept going with it but then after the second one someone was like hey I love what you're doing can you activate this gallery and so they gave me this gallery and we signed like a six month agreement I ended up staying for about seven and a half months but um wait 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 i lost it i got distracted no just it was about the emphasis on servicing other right artists. thank you thank you thank you um servicing artists kind of came from this whole idea that um the the selling everything i don't know i think the the artists that's the heart of everything and that's what i just enjoy that's what it comes down to i just enjoy working with artists and i just decided that that's the most fulfilling way to do what i'm good at Hmm. You know, a lot of people are just great salespeople. I, I can sell things. I'm, I'm good at selling stuff, yeah. but I don't enjoy it the same way that I enjoy, like, completing an event, executing an event. I'm an execution, executioner. I don't know. I, I make your dreams come true. Uh-huh. That's the point. You know, it's like you have this big vision. You come to me, and then we figure out how do we, like, we work backwards. This is what you want to do. What do we need to do to make that possible? You know, so that that's my role. So in terms of, of working with artists, one thing, I guess it's a misconception that you can help us out with. And, and we talked about this um, with Robert Hodge as well is um, the perception of art being this elitist thing to be a collector. You have right. to be this rich, elite person to collect art. And so it kind of shields a certain uh, demographic away that sometimes you still want that demographic there. You want them to, to collect art, but how, how do you bridge those gaps as a creative person that's in the arts and working with artists and trying to figure out, okay, I want to reach the people and I want the people to have my art hanging in their house, but how do I bridge that gap of 
right. selling it to them and they could afford it and then it's not just looked at as oh i'm not i can't afford art i mean there's so many different outlets right so i think with this show in particular we've been talking a lot about how there's all these like shows around houston that you know not gonna call anybody out but sometimes you know you see the art from the ceiling to the floor, it's all mm. just kind of like hodgepodge or whatever. Yeah. You already know everything there is going to be under a thousand dollars, and if it's more than that, is is priced, you know, very obscurely. Uh, very obscurely. With this show, the way that we try to address it is with these like QR codes. So we don't mm. we don't have one that I can immediately point to around because these are like installations as opposed mm -hmm. to collectible items. But um, well. You can buy installations. Yeah. I'll just plug yeah. that. Okay. But it's, I a, talk it's about a different that too. it's a different path. Yeah, yeah. But the point is is that you know we put the prices on the wall. That's like step one. Mm -hmm. Making catalogs available, answering questions. Mm -hmm. um, but people, it's just a misconception because you know, okay. When I started Black Buddha, I wanted to create a third space, not an institution, not a gallery, but has art that. It, like equals both mm -hmm. and that's what's happening right now and I'm still kind of shocked at that but the third space the alternative space the series that collective for the culture was originally birthed out of was alt space which is like alt underscore um short for alternative space hmm. art collecting and so that was the entire idea if we remove the institution if we remove the mm -hmm. gallery and just keep the art and the artists mm -hmm nobody feels excluded because there's no like preconceived notion about what it takes to walk through these doors. But then, you know, someone can walk around here without talking to anybody, find out the price of anything and, and know whether or not that that's like in the range or not. But if you're interested in it, you're looking at it, you want to learn more about it. I'm just going to come up to you and engage with you, you know, and, and like me and Robert, we did a clubhouse last night and we were talking about that. How many galleries we've walked into with, careers with mm -hmm. a reputation in the city and still get ignored hmm, like still yeah. can't get those answers that we want i mean even like doing this show um well doing the entire series we've run into so many obstacles because people just don't understand what we're doing you know yeah. and rather than even trying to explore deeper they're just like no nah, I, don't, I don't want that well is you know? it because you still have people that are stuck in the old methodology of doing mm -hmm. things and you guys are coming with something new and innovative on the art scenes you still have the the people that's like art is it's it, it belongs here is that one of the um yeah i mean they're, they're trying but you know this show this show is disruptive mm -hmm. this show is commanding and so you know people can have whatever thoughts that they're so inclined to have but this is something you can't ignore. I do like you the know? idea of um, you guys taking ownership in it and not waiting on someone else to do it for you. That's one thing that we're big on, being yeah. self-sufficient. So I want to get into the, the history of Collective for the Culture because one of the things I respect what, what you do and what Robert Hodge does is you guys didn't sit around waiting on someone to do something. You guys said, okay, hey, we can do it ourselves. So you want to give us some, some history on how the collective for the culture was conceived and part one part two and building up to i want to say this is your biggest one right part three mm -hmm. oh so just yeah. some of that history and how that that came to light well and just like a quick plug mm -hmm. this show is twenty three thousand square feet mm -hmm. robert is a, a legend thank you because i want y'all to realize <laughs> that what it would take for a curator a his name is robert curator, too so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, i went to lanier robert too. is <laughs> no, potentially a legend but yeah, you know yeah, i don't yeah. know robert, okay no, robert, no, Hodge. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. robert Hodge, yeah. you know yeah. is a certifiable yeah. legend because yeah. honestly what it takes curatorially to conceive a space mm -hmm. this size is just um it, it really does speak volumes mm -hmm. but uh you know as far as how the show started and and everything that happened even just like us claiming our own space something an artist said to me after after round two 
they were like, you know, India, I just really have a lot of respect for you because I know so many people that paid so much to go to these like fancy art schools mm -hmm. and all they do is sit around waiting for someone to give them a job to curate mm. a show, yeah. you know? And I was just like, damn, I never thought about it like that because it's just like, you know, in our mind, like we just can't wait. We've yeah. got this like, just like fire burning in our minds and and we just gotta we gotta spread that heat you know we gotta mm -hmm. get, show the people where where it's at but uh it, it started like i said as part of our alt space uh i got you know looped into this like tri partnership to to do the union and the union was a space that um black buddha activated founded back in 2018 we did four shows the third show that we did was collector for the culture um and the first the second show which was called mama women in the arts was the first time i looped in an artist curator which was rebea Bayin. she's mm -hmm. also featured in this show mm -hmm. um she curated this amazing um female-centric show that just captivated me but it also kind of opened my eyes to the fact that when you have an artist curator they're able to loop in so many more artists that would have otherwise never really... You they have a connection to the artist. They have a deeper yeah. connection with the artist, and it creates yeah. a much more intimate experience, but then it's also like um, art by artists, hmm. you know, and, it, and it's like a lot more circular. Mm -hmm. And it, like I said, it's just so much more intimate. And so I did that show with Rubea. I loved it. And then Collective for the Culture was you know, for, for the culture, like by Migos, like yeah. came out that year and everyone was saying, everyone's like, do it for the culture. And I started thinking about that and I was like, okay, what can people really do for the culture? Buy art, because when you buy art, you're supporting people mm -hmm. that are documenting the culture and then mm -hmm. people like me who are promoting the culture yeah. and the real culture, not like, you know, all the things people said they were doing for the culture back in yeah. 2018 which was a lot they may have been ex uh, exploiting the culture <laughs> exploiting the, yeah that's a good way to put it yeah, but um yeah. you know it, it went deeper than that and so but the the true idea was about intersecting multiple parts of houston culture with the fine arts industry in houston that's your mission the, the most you got perfect yeah. person was robert hodge i knew yeah. it right away and you know i told him about the idea and he was like absolutely uh, and, and we just got straight down to business and that's exactly how it happened. You know, Robert came in, had, a, had these artists. We started with, I think, uh, six artists. Yeah, mm. we started with six artists the first round. Oh, wow. Um, and then the second time around, we had eight. This time we've got 38, you know, mm. so it's just like, So it, it, it blossomed. Yeah. 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 Quick. Yeah. Like I know I told someone I was like it's like when you get like a really cute puppy and yeah, then like right. in six months it's a, like a great day. Yeah. You know. Well, I've like, been around here and I've checked it out and I mean I yeah this is so much amazing work here but I will say the one thing I appreciate about it too is you all as artists uh, you didn't compromise the art to pander to the H. You know mm -hmm. and, and I just you know. A lot of times you go to a Houston art thing and it's it's a it's a lot of man, <laughs> you guy with a drink, purple thing, and it's like you know, there's like that doesn't represent Houston to me. That, that represents a segment of Houston, mm -hmm. you know, like. But to me, like you know, this represents Houston to me, you know, like so, absolutely because yeah. this is Houston, and that's yeah. something I've been saying time and time again. Nothing about this is a gimmick. Yeah. We didn't make anything for a photo. This is truly the work coming straight out of the studio and mm -hmm. the artists responding to what they felt in the space before anyone even saw it, you know? Um, even with these with these frames, you know, that people take the images mm -hmm. in, that's something that Robert conceived. We could mm -hmm. easily just put art in there and had nobody taking images, yeah. but he wanted to invite people to be a part of the show. So that's still an artist concept. It's like everything about the space is 100% genuine, artist, artistry, um, and intentional. Yeah, it's for artists, by artists. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we talked about with Robert Hodge, and I know you, you touched on it too, is um, training people on how to collect art. Because a right. lot of times you go and you see a price tag, you think you got to cut a check right there. There are creative ways right. on how to collect art. And that's one thing I, um, I think as, as black people, we should know that there are ways to collect art. Because, you know, we, we like labels, 
a lot of times we Gucci, Louis, you go, people will go and, and spend five hundred dollars on a Gucci t shirt in the gallery mm -hmm. and won't break a sweat because they can wear that. Yeah. It's a symbol of I have the money. With art, it's 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 in your house. It's on the wall. Hey, 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 so brother, you gotta switch that mentality of hey, brother Sav looked like Gucci on his wall you know? <laughs> he just he got a nice piece, you know. But it's like the the to switch in the mentality of mm -hmm. saying, Oh, I can't afford art, but you can afford Louis Vuitton. You could afford Gucci. Even if you can't, you'll find a way to get the name brand labels as opposed to right. something that'll appreciate over time. Because that Gucci bag is not going to appreciate over time. That art will appreciate over time. So just getting into that mind state of how to invest, looking at art as an investment. Mm -hmm. There's two ways of thinking of it, right? If you're just starting with collecting, the chances of you being willing to make a true, real investment mm -hmm. Is, is fairly slim because mm -hmm. the real investment is going to be looking like a house. Mm -hmm. You got to be serious about yeah. it. You know, if you're talking about I'm buying this to make money in mm -hmm. the future or yeah. in in the next generation for my yeah. children, it, we're talking real investments. Mm -hmm. It are gets very pricey, just like mm -hmm. any other kind of investment that anyone would typically consider. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to early stage investing, it's really best to let them know that's not what it's about. You can start by finding, you know, early, or how do I wanna describe this? Prints and editions and like early stage collecting. So, okay, what we have with this show is we've got artists that Robert, myself, you know, um, the people that are involved in the show have identified. Well, really, it's, it's Robert and myself. I don't wanna like convolute that, but we've identified artists that are consistent enough, talented enough, distributing work that is at this high quality and affordable. So all we're doing is saying, hey, this is someone who I think you can afford right now, hmm. who that work, we have a good feeling well, that it's going to be worth more. Most of them say you better more. buy my rookie card now, because after this year, the price ain't going down. Right, <laughs> right. but that, that's the whole yeah. point. You know, we yeah. can never know, because any anything can happen, and mm -hmm. that's the thing. It's like it is a risk, just like any any investment, yeah. right? But we're doing kind of that legwork. We're doing yeah. the research. Ready? Oh, right, yeah, we're gonna, we're pull it up. Okay, I'm <laughs> okay. just passing it. I just, <laughs> I just saw you be like, mm. yeah. no, I was just, <laughs> no, I was just, <laughs> no, I was answering because I had a question after you but, finished. Because you know what I'm saying? But, but I was yeah, answering. you I was know, like, we do the yeah. work to identify artists that are good starting investments, mm -hmm. and if anything, it's work you're gonna love. If you want to get into art collecting, find an artist that you love, find a practice mm -hmm. that you appreciate, understand, and just get behind it. Because the more you support an artist, and Robert said this yesterday, and I loved it, which is like, if you do make an investment, let's say you spend $5,000, it's a small work, but it's an artist that has a pretty like dependable career, mm -hmm. they have that consistency, they're hitting all those marks for you, you love the practice, CV is right, you know, you got that kind of co-sign by a great exhibition or whatever. Um, from that brand, point- well, I'm just saying that's like a, that's an early piece, yeah, you know. Okay. So I'm saying it's like if you come in, you know, you might have like an artist that the large original works like, okay, this is the installation, but let's say this is the big canvas, and this canvas right here, let's say that's like fifty thousand dollars. You really love this artist. You don't have fifty grand right now, but you want a piece by them because you love what they do. You want to mm -hmm. support them. Maybe you you identify a print that's within your price range. Maybe that print is five thousand dollars. At that point, something you can do is start to get other people you know interested in that artist. Get them to start supporting that artist. Like, there's, like stock almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well. It's just like kind of spreading the word. And Robert said this yesterday and I just loved it because I never really thought about it in that particular way. It's like if there's an artist that you're loving, kind of go out of your way to tell people. It's like you just bought this work. It could be an original work, like these pieces right here. Yeah. You it know, really raises um, the stock of, of that person because they're getting more and more, getting more look. people. Attention, like going yeah. to their shows, like whether it be by prints or smaller original works, paper works, like there's all kinds of different entry points. Mm -hmm. But the, the really special thing about what we do here is we answer questions without any kind of like preconceived notions. You know, like my goal is to make sure that that artist, if you love their work, that I can connect y'all some kind of a way. Hmm. You know, there's all different kinds of things, but even like, you know, I've seen different kind of deals where it's like somebody who's always hosting dinner parties with people that have like, 
you know, the connections, the resources yeah. to support artists, mm-hmm. but maybe that person doesn't, but they want an artist to come and like put some art up for this yeah. dinner party so yeah. that they can talk about them. The artist yeah. talks about their work. So there's there's a hundred different help? ways. Does that, that's good marketing. Right, or, because it's like yeah. maybe I can't buy your work, but maybe my friends can. Yeah, and I can you expose come and, your like, work to other I can, can expose you. So it's like sometimes supporting an artist goes even way deeper yeah. than, than cutting that check right there. So people just got to realize if you respect a practice, just ask. Like, what can I do, you know? Um, and also payment plans. I just, yeah. like, you have to know that. Yeah. A lot of art is bought over the course of a long period of time. Yeah. It's really not about cutting the check right there. Yeah. Most and I think that's a preconceived yeah, notion right. that yeah, a that's lot of people have. Of you get scared. You see the, it's like a sticker shock. You, you mm-hmm. see it like, whoa. But you don't know that you can, you can make payments over time mm-hmm. to get that work. But one, one thing um, you brought up, you used the word installation. And just uh, the idea of an installation versus uh, what would, as opposed to an installation, what would it just be art that's... I, I wrote down that's, four words. I would um, have four art words. That's, I, I, activates, I, I, activation, um, loop. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm trying to yeah, find a word in here. Like an installation I, I may I not be for saying. sale. I'm a note-taking group. Right. right, so in this case, this is a soft sculpture by Barbara Marinero, mm-hmm. and these were made for the space. So the an installation, it's called in pseudo. So that is an art installation made for the space. An installation also can include like a sculpture or something that's essentially just built for whatever the environment is. Mm-hmm. In the case of collecting, right? So let's just say you love her style, you really want something like this in your home, but like actually somebody asked me, so Y'all can't see this, but, um, you know, she's got something like this, but very similar. It goes onto the floor. Someone's asked me, what if I wanted this draped over my staircase and installed in a different way? Now we're talking about a commission. So Mm. a commission is when you ask an artist to make something custom for you, for your space. Okay. And in pseudo installation, that's very exhibition. That's like an academic term. So you you wouldn't call something in your house like an in pseudo exhibition or sorry, installation. You would call it like a commission artwork that you own. So um, depending on where the work is, the title kind of changes. But uh, yeah, we have multiple installations. So we've also got like Preston Gaines over there with the plants. He brought in all of these plants and created an environment. He's Mm -hmm. a plant-based installation artist. So he takes over his space. So some of the stuff, like even like with this, right, where how it's out in the element and it's like, it's not like covered or anything like that, does like the, naturalness of it being out add value to it like if it has like you know just you know let's say the the piglet it ain't as white as it was on day one does that add more value to it because it's like age like it's it's <laughs> it's you know what i'm saying With, uh, so- art does not consistently age like fine wine unfortunately yeah. uh okay. you know because like okay so i said consistency yeah so let's say artists they're super hot right now. Mm-hmm. They're getting show after show after show. People are buying it up. Mm-hmm. And then they get, let's just say, canceled. Mm-hmm. None oh, of that. None of any canceled? of that stuff. I, you yeah. know, this is just Artists, purely everybody an gets example. Canceled nowadays, Anyone man. can get canceled. All I'm yeah. saying is, is like the art will absolutely lose value. I'm not saying it's like a rule of thumb, uh, but they're like, you know, whatever you have, it could disappear in a second. I mean, a but clean cut artist to invest hey, well, in. that, Tell me, right. though, you know, because like, you know, outside of GHH, I, you know, I run a flip school, you know, we, now one of the options I always see is is art pieces. But I, I'm, I can't, I don't know the person who made it and who did this. So if mm-hmm. you were looking, if you were just, there was 70 pieces here and you're just looking at them, how do you, you just going with just the eyeball? Is there any way to know what? Uh... Depending on what you're trying to do, like I said, yep. the best way to buy art for your personal is to just love it. Cause then that yeah. way you're never gonna regret it, right? Okay. Yeah. But then if you're talking about flipping works, you gotta do the research. Like that's just the bottom line. You okay. gotta know what their history is. And then if you're, let's say they're brand new, but you just truly believe they're a great talent, like a marketing plan is due. 
yeah. you know you can't just like believe in them and say like you're so talented i like here's all my money like you're gonna go far you ever heard that saying yeah. um <laughs> uh they were saying a check on your strong friend let's say, say that yeah on. okay uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna see if i can connect the connector you know i i, I got a small role in the art world you know i'm gonna go ahead and give you this plug you know <laughs> plug, uh, plug me up i mean uh, normally i'm the plug but that's what i'm saying <laughs> okay. but sometimes the plug, <laughs> plug, 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 you know, plug yeah. uh brother who i'm good friends with went to undergrad with his name is parsons he did uh the damn cover for kendrick lamar he, he's uh he's arguably the best I photographer love that album. Okay. yeah he's arguably the best photographer in the world right now so i'm gonna call him when we get off, when we finish this, I can't, I can't promise you're gonna answer, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm gonna try to make that happen for you. Cause I, I the, what you described is what I've been telling him. He's he needs, and and it's just it's not just literally about him. Mm-hmm. It's just what you're saying. Like culture needs people like you know like you. You know, there's like you know our derivative of you. People don't see, but we you know people like who I feel like the people who connect and try to put others who really are who really can benefit from uh those people who maybe know how to present it or know how to package it know how to sell it i mean that's like that's a guy you're doing divine work you know because yeah. artists you know most artists very few that i've met had hustle you know their hustle was drawing and you know whatever it was their craft was so you someone like you that's a and i'm glad you're in houston too you know because you got a, you know, you got a Brooklyn vibe, you know, you got a nice, you know, coffee house, Soho, you know, something <laughs> like that. So I'm glad that we were able to, to get you, you know, and get you to park here. Um, yeah. do you- I love Houston. People, people always like, I don't know, I'm like, got this real slender frame in my glasses. I don't know. I love Houston. I love everything about this city, you know. Uh, in 2019, I, I hurt a couple of my artists' feelings because I kind of like stopped working in the arts for like six months but i don't know why everyone's feelings were so hurt but the point is is you know i was just like i mean if you have someone that's kind of like a a, you know rooting for you and want to see you succeed you know if you don't have that yeah they'll they'll feel that boy i just had to kind of go where i needed but i I got a question for you um since it's women's history month coming up right march March, 1st march 1st your um your history as a as a black woman coming to the creative scene, the art world, the roadblocks. If another young young lady wants to, she's looking at you and she's trying to figure out, man, how do I do it or what, what roadblocks or how do I navigate it? Um, just you being a black woman, doing what you do, what are some of the roadblocks? Or some things that you've just learned from and you've just overcame it? Because uh, I, I don't want to assume that it's just, it's just been easy because you've been a woman in the art world doing what you do. No, as a it's been it's been everything or as a but producer, easy. Rather. It's been everything but easy. And um, yeah, man, I'm tough. I'm real tough, and I can see that now more than ever because it's like once I start saying like you become hardened. I don't think I become hardened. I just mm-hmm. had to grow into myself because mm-hmm. when I first started, I came from this position. I don't really know anything. Like everybody teach me. I'm listening. I'm here. I'm like, I'm helping. Now it's like, you don't know what you're talking about yeah. and you need to go talk to somebody else, but you're not talking to me right now. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. but th- there's been a lot of barriers. I, you know, I was just saying, it's like, I've got this like slender frame. Like I come in, like it, everyone was always like, oh, and you're so innocent. Like I've seen a lot, I've done a lot. I've been working my ass off. Like just, that's the truth. Yeah. And um, the barriers, a lot of down talk. Like people really want to kind of create this scenario where, you know what, let me, let me tell you how we do business. The way business works is Oh, this, they get you, yeah. You know, and it's just yeah. like, okay. The I condescending, know you, you, you the condescending fly, talk. You know. But at this point, after the yeah. show especially, yeah. it's like you, you really can't, mm-hmm. you can't, what are you going to say? Because I'm shit. sorry, it's like, I, I, like, do you look around. Yeah. Look around I because it's like this, this whole thing was put on by three people, myself, Robert, and Hodge, my assistant, coordinating dozens of people Mm -hmm. and I'm talking solely about the art show because there actually has been a lot of people that have helped with um, everything outside of the art and then also obviously the artists that um, participate in making it happen Mm -hmm. 
But it was just the, the, stuff the, that people the don't see. Team, like, yeah, I know. I don't. I don't want to make yeah. anyone feel bad because yeah. a lot of people did help. But, but just as the far stuff as that like people don't see. the core team that got the art show up was three people, and so that's the whole thing. It's like this is a miracle, and a lot of people don't have that experience. Yeah. And so we we pulled it off. I'm astounded by us. But yeah, the barriers. I mean, even I was telling this story. There was like a whole moment where I was like cornered by this like older gentleman, you know, and he's trying to convince me like to pay for this expense that they had already agreed to pay. And they've just come in the corner like, well, you know, like uh, if you could just, uh, 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 and it's like, no, you signed a contract. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know why you're trying to like tap into like my emotional core. Cause mm. when it comes to my business, it's yeah. not there. Like. Business is business. Well, yeah. That's your business. As, as, as Benny that's would say, bill. business is business. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Right. And it was just yeah. kind of crazy. It's like, you know, this is someone that's got like 30 years on me talking about a $50 yeah. bill or some some bullshit, you know. Intimidation and, tactic. And think? it just didn't work because I I think it's like the amount of work that I'm willing to put forward. I, I realized real quick, you know, when it was just like, I'm not entertaining this. But you need to do like, I want, I got a challenge for you. I want you to error on the side of arrogance. Cause I know you have so much humility that your arrogance is actually just saying what you did, you know, like, so, but we need to, we need to stand on our accomplishments. And I learned that, you know, firsthand, because if we don't, we'll be sitting here training, you know, one of these Edomites who don't even know the job, you know, and it's, it's like, okay. you spike your, spike your football. Cause look, you did the work. Look, I did do the work. And the truth is, is like, I, uh, I'm always just trying to rein it in and not not step on anybody's toes. Step but on some but toes. the truth is, is step like on some toes. nobody else has done anything like this. And mm -hmm. and it took me a while to even just like be like, oh shit, you know. But the truth is, is I've had to be insanely flexible, insanely trusting, mm -hmm. and just like really, really strong. Like this was what felt impossible i've got videos for me at three in the morning sleeping in the dressing rooms you know what i mean like it's like you can't quit every time like someone's like oh i need money for this i need money for that it's like all right here's the money you know it's like you just can't quit and you always have to be willing to have those hard conversations and it's like i am a bulldog like i am the one that fights the battles like i'm the one that goes to war and i'm not afraid mm -hmm. and i learned that like i cannot be well, afraid yeah, that's, that's the thing. Like, sometimes if, if a woman is aggressive people just say oh she's a bitch if yeah. a man is straight if, up if a man is aggressive it's like oh, okay i should be wearing my beanie because I, the whole three and a half weeks of install i was walking around with the beanie that said mr Bitch. And it's like, hit me right, yeah. you know, because yeah. it's like, I don't, I don't care what you think because everybody, and this has been an ongoing theme. Everybody feels like if they were in my position, they would do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. but I'm looking around. I'm looking in the past. I'm looking in the future. You've never been in my position. You're mm -hmm. never going to be in my position. Show your work. Right? So just yeah. like respect it or really like get the fuck out. Like, so, so that's this what show it goes is, like, we're a history show, but we're also about history in the present because we're making history. <laughs> as we talk now i know i'm laughing so, i'm thinking it's like we're recording this late at night this, and then it's gonna be in the morning <laughs> this little this little young future india love joy is gonna watch this it's gonna be on youtube and they're gonna go back and they're gonna watch it and, and you're gonna give that young india some advice you know what are um what's some advice that you would give someone that's coming up in the future it's kind of like if this this is a time capsule, right? This is this right. is history in the making, and you're just giving some some advice that if you had someone, and I don't know if you did, maybe you did or maybe you didn't, um, but what advice would you give? It's, it's the, you know how people say, what would you tell your younger self? Yeah, what absolutely. What would you tell a, a younger person? Um. So when I was doing collective for the culture too, I actually recorded a, a voice message to my future self and mm. somehow I found it while I was working on this show and I couldn't even believe it because it was just this random voice recording with no label or anything mm. and it was like to my future self I'm working on a flyer it's 11 o'clock at night the show opens in two days I'm freaking out right now you know but it, it has some advice yeah. in there but I think the most beautiful thing and this goes to all young people it, and this is something my dad said to me, which is like, you know, people say life is short, life is long. 
Life is a long and complicated journey, and and you gotta yeah. be prepared to be inside of you for as long as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. Like you're not gonna ever exit this body, mm-hmm. and and you know to the people that are trying to do things in the arts is you can't give up and you can't really trust everything that you hear, especially when it comes to like learning about art. You know I do my best to deliver the truth, but to anyone that's listening and trying to learn from what I'm talking about you also have to find your own answers and feel mm-hmm. confident in that, Preach. you know? And so for the young women, especially, it, 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 it all comes down to trusting yourself and not being afraid. And, and you know, not you don't need to work with everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's something someone said to me, a particular doing this show, which is like, you don't need to work with just anybody. Well, you are now work. in a position where you can just say no. And, and the truth is, is I was always in that position. Mm-hmm. To just say no, like I don't need every job, I don't need every every partner, sponsor, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I can just do what I'm trying to do and find mm-hmm. the people that support in that or believe in that. And if I can't find those people, make those people. Train somebody, yeah. find your team, build them up from scratch. Like, you know, I was really lucky to um, get an intern back in 2018 that I was able to train to learn how to do everything that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like building those long-term relationships really inform my practice, you know, and... You ain't for everybody, you know? Absolutely. And and this life is not for everybody. Like, I assure you... Yeah, especially when you create a position that may not have been carved out. You may have... Mm -hmm. you, You may not have had an example for your agency. It seems like you, you saw different examples and then you created what you wanted to see yeah, you felt in the art world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. we're going to wrap it up. I got to ask, ask you one question for God because I heard, you know, Spirit Recognized Spirit. What you, what you be reading? Hmm? What, what books? Are you a reader? I, I heard some. I heard <laughs> he some, wasn't here earlier. I heard some. I heard some fans. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he wasn't. I heard here. some. I heard the couple. Come on. You know, yeah. all right, we're going to talk about it now. But you can't get nothing past me. I heard, yeah. I, hey. Well, we're wrapping it. up, you, you know. It, we'll, we'll we'll chop it up after. But Most definitely. Most what I what books. I do want want you to um, leave for all of the people that's gonna watch this is the importance of collective for the culture three. Um, just and I know you guys are wrapping it up the uh, um, at the end of this, this month. month. No, no, yeah, this month, this weekend. This weekend. This is, weekend. Yeah, this so is the end of air. February. This is gonna air um, probably first Thursday in March. When people see it, so mm. it'll um, probably well. Then be there might be a but, surprise for you tomorrow. Oh. But, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but but we do want um, want you to just tell the people the importance of something like Collective for the Culture Three, not just in Houston, yeah, in Houston, but just even globally, why people should connect with Collective for the Culture Three because now in the digital the digital era. People can go on Instagram and they can follow you mm-hmm. and, and they can follow Collective for the Culture and, and people can still look at the artwork and hopefully they can still collect even if they're not physically here. Right. So what's one of the takeaways you want to tell people? Uh, Collective for the Culture is representative of dozens of creatives, artists, sculptors, muralists, painters. I mean, there's so many people that are represented by this motion. And so this is the first year we introduce a ticketed event. Those tickets go to make all of this possible. Like, it, one does not exist without the other. The same with the artists, but beyond that, we are trying to create something that is born, birthed out of Houston, and something that's gonna really make Houston an art-centric area, like mm-hmm. internationally recognized. This is just the beginning. Twenty-three thousand square feet—that's mm-hmm. nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, like we do the next this, time. Yeah. Yeah. right? You know, we're yeah, trying yeah. to do this four times over, five times over. Like Miami, Art Basel, like all of that. Mm-hmm. That is just still just a subset of of those primary spaces. This is the third space. This mm-hmm. is the third coast. We're yeah. doing something totally new here, and this is going to be something that everyone will remember. Mm-hmm. Will remember. You know, I think that uh, this show started as just a title. That's all it was mm-hmm. in the beginning. We didn't know anything about anything. Well, I mean, we knew a lot about art, 
but we didn't know what it was going to be or what it was going to look like. And I remember the first time Robert painted one of those like color blocks on one of my white walls. And I was kind of scared, you know, I was just like, damn, <laughs> like, I didn't know you're going to do that, you know, but uh, <laughs> an artist came out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but that's what I love about working with artists, curators is they just take it to a new level. But the point is, is that um, this is an artist curator. This is completely black produced. This is, you know, 40 artists. Uh, it's, it, this is not an all black show. Yeah. Black Buddha does not only mm-hmm. represent black artists, mm-hmm. but it is like a primarily black artist show. Mm. There's so all much age history ranges here. Of artists too. We've got sculptures from George Smith from the 80s. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Those works would have never been seen by this audience unless we did this show. So when you support this show by collecting works or buying a ticket, it actually goes to build up so many more people than you could ever imagine. Before we finally wrap it up, is there a way that people can just donate? If they, if if someone is watching this and they're in Dallas or they're in California or New York and they can't buy a ticket, mm-hmm. but they still want to donate to the event, is it a way for them to do that? Actually, yes. Although now that I think about it, there's a donate option on the Eventbrite, but... Um, that'll be down by the time this is up. So, uh, you know, really, I would say connect over Instagram um, or email me. You can contact me at indiablackbuddha.agency and that's blackbuddha.agency. And yeah, you know, let me know because rather than just like writing a check because, you know, that's kind of obscure find out about projects that you can fund and things that we can make happen and ways yeah. that I can kind of like generate that money towards supporting more artists and what they're doing. I think, you know, when it comes to everything that's going on with this show, if you just want to contribute to the show, I mean, like, it it took a lot. So, yeah. you know, absolutely there. But, you know, if you are just interested in getting into the arts, investing, if you're not ready to buy work, but you really want to see more things like this happen, just talk to me. Like, we work in all kinds of ways. And, you know, this this is one of them. Just just letting people know what we're doing is a, is a huge part of that. Well, on behalf of Gentleman's History Hour, we appreciate yourself as well as Robert Hodge. We're filming on location. We normally have a place where we film, but you guys open the doors and we don't take that for granted. So I wanna say thank you. Thank you, Collective for the Culture 3, mm-hmm. for doing what you guys are doing in the city of Houston. And also, I just wanna send a special shout out to the state of Texas. We had oh my a, God. A, a blizzard, well, we call it, you know, a snowstorm or- That was a nightmare, storm. okay, that I mean, was a lost, natural disaster. People lost power, yeah, people lost water. water, we lost, yeah, people I mean, cause some people, lives. you know, on the East Coast, they, they, yeah. they kind of say, oh, you, you guys are down south, but they don't understand if they had to deal with the Houston heat in Chicago, in the Midwest, and up north, they would probably be falling out and we'll say, they wouldn't want was, us to look I at them and say, ha, 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 that. y'all can't handle the heat. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes, you know, people look at us like, oh, y'all couldn't, couldn't take it. But no, we lost power. People lost war- water. So shout no, out to the state. No, people lost their lives. State. And, and lives. I think that that's very lives important to point out. Like, yeah, we were, were severely lost. failed by our leadership, and we're not yeah. prepared and put in an awful situation just a week ago. And we're still yeah. here grinding. And that's just the culture of, of Houston, you know. And honestly, is for better or worse, we don't stop working. And, and, you know, last week was very unfortunate and it really, it really messed up a lot of stuff for the city, for the state, and it, and it shouldn't have happened. It yeah. really should not have happened, so. So I want to say thank you, Toast. Cheers. Salud. I don't have nothing left. This is a, <laughs> he got the bottle We, we heard that bottle clink, okay? <laughs> But yeah, this cheers, is, thank you for having me. This yeah. has been great. I love talking about what I do because honestly, sometimes I'm working so much that I never get a moment to like breathe. Y'all saw me running around tonight just getting at this point, yeah. you know, so it's just been a pleasure. Lastly, on equality. Yeah. Oh, Rob J. Tenet. And this, India Lovejoy. Got my man Savvy <laughs> producing. This is Gentleman's History Hour. Y'all subscribe on the YouTube channel. Like it, love it, salute, peace. If you're watching this on YouTube, man, hey, y'all, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. This is Gentleman's History Hour.